talked about last night. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> so I got invited to a birthday party a couple weeks ago, and I went into my closet, and you know, I don't always wear sneakers, y'all, okay? I, I like to dress dress, okay? And so I, I went into my closet, and I pulled out my bestest GQ, you know, Saturday night go out vibe outfit, and I walked out the closet, and my wife was like, you're too overdressed. And I said, you, you know, we're going to a party. You got to dress for the season, right? So when I get to this party, she made me dress down, okay? And when I get to this party, the man hosting the party gets out of his vehicle in tight black pants, a white, beautiful dress shirt, and a beautiful black bow tie. And I looked at my wife, I knew I should have dressed up. So last night I was invited to a birthday dinner. And what did I do? I texted the man of God, Kenneth, and I said, Kenneth, are we dressing up tonight? I'm not looking like a fool a second time. This only happens to me one time. And he said, you know, sis is bougie from Atlanta, so we're going to dress up. And I said, I got you. Show up at the restaurant, right? And they, we had to wait a little bit. And the hostess walked us over to our table. And the hostess looked at me and she says, are you a rapper or something? And Pastor Rod was on cloud nine at that moment, okay? And I said, I said, no. And she said, are you famous? And I said, in heaven. And my wife's like, oh, my God, here we go. So I told her that I was, low-key, I told her, I said, soy reggaetonero. <laughs> now, I didn't tell you what I was wearing, but, you know, I was dressed up. You know what I'm saying? I like to dress for the season. I want to embrace the season. So guess what? I'm in summer mode just a few weeks ahead of time because you know what? It's hot out there. I hope you guys are too. I just feel like this, the year is moving so quickly and it, it goes in tune with what God told us, the word move at the end of last year. And I believe he's been faithful to it. I believe we've seen new families. We've seen salvations. We've seen baptisms here. We've seen our highest Sunday attendance uh, in the history. We've seen leaders rising up. We see families growing both physically and spiritually. Babies are being born. Engagements are going forth. Marriages are going forth. Graduations are going forth. Businesses are growing. Businesses are birthed. Promotions are coming. Raises are coming. I mean, come on, man. This is exciting. How can you not be excited? I'm excited with all the babies. Like every other couple is having babies. I love it. They get to stay at their house, not our house, okay? I'm sending mine out, okay? Got one left I need to take to the finish line. Listen, we, we, we've seen so much freedom and deliverance. It's so inspiring and powerful. Can I tell you, Union Houston, there's a movement here. And I don't know if you're new. I'm going to tell you something. There's a movement happening here. And I'm so grateful for everything God's done. But can I tell you, before, the, before I leave this year, I want to grow some more. And I asked our, our Monday night dinner group, like, hey, what are you grateful for and what do you want to grow in? We all got to be growing in something. You know why? Let me tell you something. Movements are made of moments. And I don't want to waste a single moment on not growing into my best self. I hope you are looking forward to growing as well. Now, let me recap what we've been on this journey that we've been moving on. On Resurrection Sunday, I preached to you that he did it. And I even gave you a personal testimony of a miracle that God did for me. That he can, will, and still doing it today. And then the, the following week, I followed up with that he's on our journey with us. That he's never far away. That he's walking with us through our seasons. I know there's someone walked in here today that's been in a dry season. He's on the journey with you. But I don't know if you noticed, but we've been on Luke 24 for about a month now. I haven't moved from Luke 20. We've just been moving along Luke 24. You know, you can preach out of the Bible just moving right along the ch chapter after chapter. You don't have to jump around. And here we see, you know, Jesus has just finished walking with these two guys, the road to Emmaus. That's the, the, the word I preached on. He's in the journey, right? And in a moment, they realize that Jesus had been with them and then left. And, and you know what they do? They realize that he had left. So they run back to report it. Isn't that interesting that when we realize what God's done, the first thing we want to do is we want to go tell our friends and our family, look what God did for me. Look what God did for me. This is what they do. 
But watch what the Bible says. Luke chapter 24, verse 33 says, they didn't waste a single minute. I don't want to waste a single minute. I don't know if you came to church, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, I don't want you to waste a single minute, a single moment. They were on their way back, back to Jerusalem. They found the 11. Their friends gathered, talking away. It's really happened, they say. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Can I tell you what was happening? These Israelites aren't like, you know, white people in America, okay? They're not all very civil. White people, I love it. They can have an argument and be very calm. And, and you know, they, these Jews are more like a Latino household. They're all yelling and screaming, no, está loco, you're lying, mentiroso, and all this other stuff, Okay. This is the disciple. I'm telling you, if you've ever been around Jewish people, Middle Eastern people, they love to scream and shout. They don't mean nothing by it. It's cultural, okay? And they're sitting there discussing, arguing, yelling, debating who's right, who's wrong, who did see it, who didn't see it. You got it wrong, Peter. And in the moment, in the moment, something happened. So here's this argument happening. They're all talking. And Luke chapter 24 says in verse 36, while they were still talking about this, while they were still arguing and debating and discussing, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them appropriately, peace be with you. Shalom. They were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do you let doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and look at my feet. Look at it is I myself. Look at what I have done. Touch me and see. I wonder today if you came to church for the first time in a long time. And that word's for you. Look at him and touch him. He's in the room. I don't know if you saw that just a few moments ago. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, you see, as I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still, and while they still do, did not believe, bien tercos, it, because of the joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things and I'm going to send you I need you to wait I'm going to send you what my father has promised you I don't want you to waste a moment doubting I don't want you to waste a moment arguing about nonsense I just want you to wait because he's promised you and while you stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high let's pray father we thank you Thank you that you promised us from power from on high. I ask you, Holy Spirit, you are that power from on high. You come into this room and overwhelm us, speaking to us and teaching us, moving us and stirring us. Holy Spirit, help me deliver with clear thought, clear tone, and clear delivery. The meditations of my heart that you've put inside of me. May this rhema word be a seed in someone's heart that grows into a forest of their life. I thank you, Jesus. And we pray these things in your mighty name. And the church said, amen. The meditations of my heart today are, is titled, A Movement Made of Moments. I want to talk to you today about a movement made of moments. I want to encourage you that just like these disciples had an encounter and an experience with the resurrected living God, the Lord Jesus, I believe and I declare that you too will have an encounter. So don't waste 
this moment. Maybe you're new and you're looking for some hope, for some peace and some strength. Maybe, maybe you've been a while, but it's been a season. You ever been in those seasons? You ever been in one of, the, one of the seasons where it's one thing after another after another? That was this morning for me, y'all. Maybe, maybe you're just tired. Or like me, you know, I don't just get tired. I get tired. Yeah, anybody get tired? I get tired. Ooh, tired. That's, don't talk to me. Maybe you're tired, tired, dry. Empty or discouraged. My prayer and hope is that today you have an encounter and an experience with the Holy Spirit. And you can use this moment to join in the movement that we've been on. See, the kingdom of God is a movement. And what I don't want you to do is waste the moment. Last week, I binge watched a show on HBO called The Winning time. Dr. Gerald Buss was a chemist by profession, but was rather successful at real estate investing. He owned hotels, resorts, expensive apartment complexes all throughout Bel Air and Beverly Hills. He owned big commercial buildings, including the Chrysler Building in downtown Manhattan, New York. In 1979, though, he had a brainiac idea. He decided to buy a failing basketball team in a failing basketball league for a record-breaking dollar amount of $67.5 million. Now, Jack Cook, the previous owner, was selling this thing, and he had built the arena they played in on what's called the balloon loan payment and wasn't disclosed for Dr. Buss. If you don't know what a balloon loan payment is, is you pay a really low payment for a while, and then all of a sudden, the bank says, pay up, sucker, you owe me the rest. Well, he didn't disclose this to Dr. Buss. And Dr. Buss now was the proud owner of a failing basketball team with a huge $3 million debt due in just a couple of months right after taking possession and ownership. The coach, the genius coach he hired and recruited, fell off a bike and had horrible brain injury and could not return. His mother, the genius accountant, and his mentor and the person he looked up to was diagnosed and was dying of metastatic cancer. I wonder if you've ever been in this situation where you made a decision and all of a sudden all hell starts breaking loose. But Dr. Buss had learned one thing about life and success. He knew that in life you will have losses, problems, issues, adversities, and setbacks. But in order to move forward and truly see success, you will have to weather the storm. And eventually, it'll go your way. Even though he looked like he had overspent money on a disaster, You know what he didn't do? He didn't waste a moment. He had vision. He innovated. He pioneered and even transformed a team, a city, and a league. He drafted a 19-year-old, million-dollar smiling, basketball phenom, the greatest thing out of East Lansing, Michigan, by the name of Irvin Magic Johnson. Even though everybody else said, no, you got to draft Larry Bird, Jerry Buss said, no, that guy, he's a winner. That genius coach developed a style of play that he passed on to the other coaches, what's called today a fast break. And this gave way for a more exciting style of playing used till today. He turned the L.A. Forum into a red carpet atmosphere. Every game, courtside seating with famous people like Jack Nicholson. His daughter came up with this idea of having the Laker girls and no less hired Paula Abdul to lead them to create this atmosphere. The VIP club called the Forum Club, and it was the hottest place to hang out in in the 80s. And he discovered one of the greatest basketball coaches that have ever coached the game. And his name is Pat Riley. He also dressed like a G. My goodness, those Armani suits, they still look good. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and remember that balloon payment he owed? Oh, yeah. He convinced the bank and made a deal with them. And that forum became known as the Great Western Forum, home of the amazing historical L.A. Lakers and what is known as Showtime. 
Jerry Buss didn't waste a moment thinking to himself, my God, I got cheated. Jack Cook lied to me. He used every moment to build a movement to, that saved the Lakers, saved the league, and made the NBA what it is today. You know what that is? Exciting. You can thank Dr. Jerry Buss. Oh, you know who else didn't waste a moment? His daughter, Jeannie Buss. Most of these ideas were hers. And today, she is the president and proud owner of the most successful, most expensive basketball team that has existed in the NBA and third most successful and valuable sports team in all the world. A $67.5 million investment today is worth $5.5 billion. Only behind the New York Yankees and your Dallas Cowboys, fellas. Not the Texans. Texans worth about a buck 25. Did I mention the Lakers went on to win five championships in the 80s and created the greatest basketball dynasty that has ever bounced the ball? When I was watching this show, which by the way, I watched it like in two days, this story of Jerry Buss reminded me of today's passage. It said they didn't waste a single minute. These disciples had been through a lot. They'd seen Lazarus be raised from the dead. They did the triumphal entry. They'd been through the Last Supper. They had their feet washed. They watched Jesus get arrested and betrayed. He watched him get crucified. And then they watched the resurrection happen. They, they, they weren't about to waste a moment. They, they were discussing all the events. And standing there comes Jesus and says, peace be with you. I know, listen to me, I know life can be confusing, it can be confounding, it can be chaotic. How many of y'all know that life sometimes is that? Sometimes it's all three at one time, you know what I'm saying? Like Monday morning sometimes for y'all. Things we planned didn't go our way. The results, we worked so hard and we wanted just didn't come our way. Wasn't given to us. The health report didn't give you what you, what you expected. That bill was unexpected completely. You didn't even know you owed that money. The relationship that you invested in, that you believed in, was not supposed to be that way. Am I talking to anybody or am I talking to myself? The loneliness, the depression, and the anxiety just seems unfair. You haven't done anything to deserve it. You prayed and hoped for the best and never thought of preparing for the worst. Don't waste a moment. Because we see in this passage is in our worst moments, he gives us peace. It's in our worst moments that he gives you peace. It's in our worst moment. Not only does he give you peace, but I don't know if he caught that. It says that he stood there amongst them and gave them peace. It's in our worst moments. So let's not look at our worst moments of life and, and, and start thinking, oh, my God, it's happening again. No, say, oh, my God, where's Jesus standing? And where is he going to give me peace? Give us peace. Shalom. We're talking about the harmony of heaven. I have harmony with God, and I have harmony with others. It's not the best moments, but the worst moments that he comes and stands with us and gives us peace. I like that because oftentimes what we think is, well, no, everything's going my way. I have peace. But it's in the worst moments that his peace is so palpable don't waste a moment don't waste a moment if today you're sitting here and you're living through a worse boy i'm not gonna make you raise your hand but i can feel the spiritual energy there are some of us that are living through some worse moments my encouragement is he's standing right here with us and he's given us the harmony of heaven there's no better joy than to know the harmony of heaven is with us it's easy to gain fake peace, I call it, peace, by substituting the worst moments of our lives with, 
A little distraction. How many of y'all like a little distraction, huh? Hey, you know what? When I'm in my worst moments, I don't want to talk to anyone, and I'm just going to scroll on Instagram and troll everyone. I'm going to go and see, compare my life to all the beautiful people of the fake Instagram with all them filters. Right? Or, or we distract ourselves with just another dinner, another vacation. Or we distract ourselves by going to the mall and I need another outfit that I don't, that I don't need. Uh, or, or distracting ourselves with drinking. How many of us want to replace the peace that we should be getting from God by drinking? I'm going to knock down three whiskeys before I go to bed. That'll, that'll give me some peace. I, get, I, I guarantee you it won't do that. It'll just develop that nasty habit that'll end up with a headache in the morning. Uh, or s- some of y'all want to get that peace. Oh, I'm only peaceful when I smoke a blunt. When I hit that vape pen. When I hit that pill. When I get that line and I snort it up, I'm going to have some peace. Some of us try to replace, try to gain that peace with unhealthy conversations. We think we can go to that person that all they do is shake their head at me. Yeah, you sure right, girl. They did you wrong. Yeah, you need to leave here and me and all, all that other stuff, right? Unhealthy conversations. It's easy to find those people. Fools are a dime a dozen. Or, or, or we lean into unhealthy relationships. Club toxica. Oh, the toxic people love it. Like, el club toxica, oh, it, it be popping. By the way, I told first of it's true. I, be, I, be, I, I, I go on it you know, sometimes on social media, and they be gassing each other up with comments and likes and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, this, that. And I'm like, oh, club toxica right there. Look at this. I don't say nothing. I just keep it a record in my, in my head right here. And I'm like, ooh, they toxic right there. Be praying for them. Pass the intercede for them. They forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Oh, oh, unhealthy actions. We react. We say things that are vile and vicious. Or we stop ourselves from fulfilling the greater joy because we're fearful that it might happen again. Am I talking to anybody? It's also easy to feel peace when everything is going right. I, I know people like that too. When, 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 when they're making all the good money and they got everything healthy in the relationships and their marriage is good and, and, and this is good and that's good and they're eating good and they're losing weight and all that. Oh, that guy got so much peace. Is that peace? Is that the only time you feel peace? Is that the only? Because that ain't faith. The promise and encouragement, though, today is that it's in our worst moments. Our Lord, the, the, the defender, our champion, he stands with us, giving us peace. Not abandoning us, standing with us, not forsaking us, standing with us, walking with us, giving us the peace that we need. He stands, but he's asking you, he's asking us, why are you so troubled? Why are you so troubled? I always thought that was interesting that Jesus, he knows what's troubling them. Why does Jesus ask, why are you so troubled? I would beg to say it's a rhetorical question to get us outside of our head. Why do you let doubts rise up in your minds and rise up? In your hearts. I got to tell you, there is someone out there who hates you to death. I'm telling you, they are so jealous of you because in God's heart, you are amazing. You are beautiful. You are exactly what he dreamed of in heaven. And he's got gifts for you. And he's got purposes for you. And he's got a destiny for you. And the devil hates that. So he's going to try to take you out by raising doubts in your hearts and minds. Jesus says, why are you so upset? I lost this much money. It's just money. I have the treasury of heaven. What are you so upset? They cheated on me. Everybody cheated on me. Why are you so upset? They talk bad about me. They talk bad about me still. Why are you so upset? 
It's different when we view it that way, ain't it? Jesus says, oh, man, look at my hands. Look at my, my feet. Look. Look at what I've done for you. Look at what I've brought you through. These feet with nail holes. Look at how much I love you. If you're new, can I tell you, it's those nail-pierced hands that open that door for you to walk in. It's those nail-pierced feet that got you here. He's in the room. And although you may be in the worst moment of your life, you're in great company. Don't waste it. Encounter him. Experience him. And he will give you peace. Even when we're in a confusing, confounding, chaotic season, the only thing we can be assured of is this. Jesus will stand with us. Jesus will walk with every moment in our life, granting us peace, bringing us the harmony of heaven. All you have to do is touch him. Don't waste the moment. You know what I found in the scripture too? It's in the weakest moments of our life that he gives us strength. It's in the, they were weak. They were weak. They thought Jesus would be there for them, for them forever. And he was gone. And now he's appearing in what they deemed to be a ghost figure. Their faith was weak. So what does Jesus do? In their weakest moments, he gives us strength. He stood there and he showed them, this is what I've done for you. This is how much I love you. And, you know, some were amazed. Some were astonished. Some were filled with joy. They were praising, praise God, hallelujah. They were clapping. They were dancing, just like the end of that worship set. That's what they were doing. Oh, my God, they were in awe. But some, some still did not believe. Some were still like dumbfounded and confused. Isn't that amazing? Unable to fully comprehend. Wait, wait, wait. What just happened? Or what's happening right now? ¿Qué, qué lo que pasa aquí? Well, wait, wait. Why he got holes? Why he walking around? That still happened to us today. He, he, he's still blowing some of y'all away. And some of us are wondering, oh, what's happening? I, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I want to talk to you about our faith a little bit in an open and transparent way. Sometimes we go into a worship room. I, by the way, I've said this before. I got the Holy Ghost inside of me so I can worship anywhere. I mean, we, we got some order, and it's a beautiful thing we got going on here. But I can go into a very Pentecostal, unruly church, and I can have me a good old Holy Ghost party. Because I'm not depending on people. I'm depending on the Holy Ghost. Amen? But every once in a while, you know, you can walk into these experiences. It's like, oh, you know, that sister over there is saying some things I don't understand. Some of us still don't get it. Well, you can't control when the Spirit grabs a hold of you. He can't help us, though, unless we're honest and we're humble. Now, what Jesus does next is mind-blowing because instead of answering their reservations, instead of answering, like, like their, their, what's happening, their discussion, he doesn't address. You y'all got that, right? He doesn't address what they're discussing. He says, hey, y'all got a cheeseburger I can munch on real quick? I'm starving. You know, uh, I mean, he, here's Jesus, and he, he, he's asking for some food. He's asking, hey, y'all got something to eat? This request is intentional, but it ain't for food. This request was to get them out of their heads. 
For them to stop thinking so much about themselves and start focusing on him and what he needed in the moment. This, this is the only thing that will stop confusion in our lives. We got to stop getting confused because we got to start asking him, what do you need, Jesus? I get that I don't understand why this is happening to me, but I got to ask Jesus, Jesus, what do you need from me? In the moment, he needed a broiled fish. And then he took it and he ate it in their presence. In another, in another translation, it says that he also ate a honeycomb. And that's a whole prophetic word that I got to tell it to you later. I, can't, I don't got time to break that down. But it's in this moment where it's in their pre he's in their presence and he's eating. He's fellowshipping. You, you got what I'm saying, right? He's fellowshipping. He's hanging out. He's not clocking in and clocking out. He's not rushing into church. Getting the word. I got my word. I got to go. I got to go meet my friends for champagne brunch. Hey, man, you know, like, you know, we got to say what we got to say. You know, I, I'm not trying to go to church. I got to go to first service because, ooh, I got this birthday party to go to. Ooh, I'm going to get turned up. The barbecue. That's not peace. I mean, what are we doing? It's fellowship. It's fellowship. It's communion with it. He's eating. He's probably eating the fish and be like, mmm, it's good. Y'all have some. And it's in this moment, it's in the weakest moments of our lives, when we get out of our heads, we stop feeling sorry for ourselves. We stop all that dialogue of negative talk. Why me? Why again? I got to, oh my God, siempre me pasa lo mismo. That idea that everyone and everything is out to get you, is against you. That they're hating on you. That they're against you. And he, 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 Jesus wants you to focus on him now. You see, it, it, ladies, I told this the first time. Not, not, not all of y'all are like Kim Kardashian, okay? Everybody, all the ladies that be hating on Kim Kardashian, right? We're not all, guys, not all of y'all are like Kanye or Dave Chappelle where you got a whole bunch of haters and stuff or stuff you're saying and doing. It's not like that. It's not that, you're not, we're not that important. We really aren't. But he's trying to get you to focus outside of feeling sorry for yourself. And he's asking them, hey, listen, what does Jesus want from you? Because if you can... Ask Jesus, get out of your head, get out of you feeling sorry for yourself, and start asking, what do you want from me? Can I tell you what he does? He'll strengthen your faith. This is really important. Because what they did was they served Jesus. They put their own needs aside. They put their own self-pity aside. And they served Jesus in their weakest moment. I wonder if you've ever viewed serving that way. If you've ever viewed serving as putting yourself aside and serving Jesus. Like, I'm talking about, number one, you serve Jesus. Yes, you serve a church, but it's Jesus you're serving within the church. Okay? I'm not talking about serving as a way to get noticed. Okay? That happens all the time. Oh, they come to church. And say, right, look at me. I'm checking out my holy roller. I'm serving today. Hey! Don't, don't, don't serve because you feel forced to serve either. That's not true. That's not real. Don't, don't serve because all your friends are making you serve. Don't serve a name. Don't serve a name called union. Serve Jesus. Don't serve this pastor. Serve the pastor named Jesus. Serve them. Serve him, not us. Now, when, when you serve people, you're actually serving Jesus you're in service of Jesus, and the, pro the, the, the byproduct is you bless people. Serving Jesus allows us to put him first for a few hours during the week. At the beginning of the week, we put our selfish desires down. We put all our needs down. We put all our wants down, our self-pity down. And we should say, hey, I don't need that. It's about laying down our excuses. Oh, Eli, it's my only day to sleep in. Bro. Can I tell you that the proverb says that flojo is no good. Laziness, no good. No bueno. A little folding of the hands, the scripture says. 
Why we got to sleep so much? Nas, the great rapper and lyricist, says that sleep is the cousin of death. I ain't trying to die just yet. Okay? Let's take a nap later, but let's serve Jesus. They, the, the other one is, they don't need me today. Oh, look at you. You're so nice. You're taking the day off because they don't need you today. I don't feel like it today. I feel like Sunday brunch. Now I was I want to smoke hookah till my lungs bleed. I mean, guys, it, it, listen. It's not about us. It's about what God desires. He yearns. He beckons. Beckons to achieve through us. Imagine missing out on smiling, smiling at someone, saying hello, hugging a person who doesn't think they're worthy of God's love, who's had a rough time, has low self-esteem, has been through it, has just been through a breakup, has lost it all. And you come to church and you gave them a hug and reminded them that there is a God of the universe that loves them, that cares about them and brought them to church. Imagine missing out on that. Imagine missing out on loving and hugging a little kid who goes to school and he gets bullied because he's a little gordito and he doesn't dress like the other kids. Maybe he saw his parents fight last night. Or maybe he's seen his dad drink too much and all he needs is a hug. We miss out. Why? Because we're feeling sorry for ourselves and we got excuses. Don't waste the moments with God. He's granting us. You know what he's He's granting us an opportunity to be the change we want to see. And it's not about us. It's about them. In our weak moments of faith, Jesus will come in and as we serve him, he will strengthen us. If we choose to serve him. Serving is like the beautiful medicine. To all our problems. As we serve others, you know what God, God does? He fills us up with the strength we need to solve that problem that is pounding on your head. You know what Paul says? Paul says that his grace is sufficient. You got a problem, you failed, you're feeling some type of way about yourself. Can I tell you grace is sufficient because it is in my weakness that God, that Christ gives me strength. He says also, Paul goes on to say that I can do all things, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens. Isn't that beautiful? Weak moments are strength. Weak moments are tests, trials, and temptations that need to be overcome. How? By serving Jesus, his bride, his mission, his vision. So my question is, how are you overcoming your weakness and your faith? You know what Jesus says? Take heart. I've already overcome the world. Don't waste a moment. Don't think about it. Get involved. Don't mull it over. Just get involved. Immediately after they began to serve Jesus and provided the food he asked them for, he, he began to remind them and encourage them. Don't you remember? I told you all these things. I spoke to you while I was still with you. I told you that. Everything had to be fulfilled about me and the prophecies and the law of Moses, the Psalms and the prophets. It had to be. And it's when he's reminding them of scripture that had already been written that he supernaturally opened their hearts. He supernaturally opened their minds. And he supernaturally opened up their understanding to the revelation of the scriptures and what they say about him, about you, and about that situation. Supernatural. We will all waver in our faith, y'all. Even me. But can I tell you, in our wavering moments, he opens our hearts to new revelation. The disciples, here they are. They know some things, but they're unsure. They're unclear. And they're quite uncertain about what lies ahead. They're un of all the things that had happened, was happening in the moment, and what would happen in the future. They, their faith was wavering even though they had spent three years with Jesus. 
If tomorrow was sure, was clear, and was certain, what's the point of faith? Is it not walk by faith and not by sight? I don't know if you caught this, but I want to recap real quick. In our worst moments, he gives us peace. How? Worship and prayer. When we worship and we pray, the Holy Spirit rises above and produces something called peace. It's found in Galatians 5. In our moments of weakness, he strengthens our faith. How? Serving. It is when we lay down our flesh and we pick up our cross like Jesus told us to and we follow the example he showed us by washing feet. This produces faith, perseverance, endurance to overcome every test, every trial, and every temptation. But what both of these things require is honesty and humility. A posture of, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need you. My wife preached on Mother's Day about my mother-in-law, who with cancer was a greeter at our church. I truly believe, which by the way, she, that wasn't the only thing. She led a small group for women, and she served Lisa Dean because she had had a stroke during the week. No one paid her for that. It was service. I truly believe it was not the medicines that gave her. It was her service and her I need you Jesus posture that got her through those years. In our wavering moments, he opens our hearts to fresh revelation. We call it a rhema word. Encouragement, correction, wisdom, edification. How? Would anybody like to know how he does that? Any, anyone interested in knowing how? Reading the word of God. Oh, my God. Look at that. Reading the word, praying about it. You know what he told Joshua? Meditated on it day and night. Day and night. Not wasting the moments of life, mulling over all the bad things you're dealing with, but rather taking what you read that morning and asking God, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for my family? What does that mean for my future? And what does that mean for my problem? I want to tell you something really wild. You know, this sermon came to me just like that. I read the passage. I prayed about it. And then I got in my car and I took a drive. And in my head, I meditated on the word. I pulled it apart. I envisioned myself in that room. I envisioned or felt what they felt. And I took in the words that Jesus was saying. And Jesus began to supernaturally unlock the understanding of what it says, supernaturally unlocking my heart so that that word, that truth can be planted in it and supernaturally stirring my heart to greater faith to live it out. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, Paul says, by reading it. So my question is, I wonder how you're doing in your wavering faith. That's what Sundays are for, by the way. So that you hear the word of God. If you miss some messages, it's hard to catch on. Like, whoa, wait, what journey are we on? If you're new, stick around. Join us in the journey that we're in. It's a movement. It's called the kingdom of God. We're excited to see where it takes us. That's what small groups are for. That's what Kenneth was talking about. Small groups, they're for you. They're for you. Some of us are in the room, we're like, life's good. I mean, yeah, I'm good. Look, I checked my Bank of America account. Ooh, yeah, it's good. You know what I'm saying? I'm in love. and I got the new whip. Put rims on that. You know, 
good. I'm going to Cancun here in a couple weeks. I can't get Cancun out of my heart right now, guys. Look, you know, listen to too much Bad Bunny. All I think about is Can- Cancun. My goodness. It's going to be bad on my pocketbook. But listen, it's easy to think life is good, but I can guarantee you, I know, listen, take it from this 47-year-old that's been around the block. There's a cloud forming up ahead. And small groups are for you to strengthen your faith, to gain peace, so that you can weather that storm the way Jerry Buss weathered his storm. The way the disciples weathered that storm. And now today we're gathered here. They never imagined. Those disciples never imagined. This is going to be a ragtag, vibrant, diverse community that's meeting at 2800 Antoine 2,000 years from now. They just wanted to make it till tomorrow. But they weathered the storm. Leader signups are up. You don't need to know much to lead a group. Just got to be willing to invite people to your house or a coffee shop, wherever you want to have it. And listen, if you're new, get in a small group. Signups go up live next week. It's what we're a church of small groups, not with small groups. But I can promise you one thing if you do that, watch how Jesus begins to open up your mind and your heart. And you're understanding to fresh revelation. This is what I want for your life. You know what I want for your life? New wine. New wine. New wine's where it's at. Yeah. This is, this is why you should be reading your Bible daily and why we've invested so many resources. If you go to the front of our uh, webpage, unionhouston.com, and you scroll down to the bottom, it says Biblical Journey. You click on that. You can download those forms and do your own Bible studies, ask you questions, that guide you on how to do it. I want it for you because I want Jesus to unlock the understanding of what he tells us because he said it is written. Therefore, we must read what is written, that Jesus is the Messiah of the world, that he had to live, suffer, and die and be raised from the dead so that the remissions of sins, past, present, and future, can be given at the repentance of our hearts. And that this message, the message that God is not chasing you to punish you, but he's in front of you with open arms that you need to go and embrace him, that's the gospel. That this gospel is what gives us peace, faith, revelation. When? All the time. Seasons and moments. God is good. And all the time, you got to live that out. I don't want us to waste our moment. You know why? Because we've been given this moment to join the movement as witnesses to a king that doesn't waste a single moment. Jesus doesn't waste an opportunity. Jesus doesn't waste a season. Jesus doesn't waste a life. He is a life redeemer. He is a life restorer. He is a resurrector of dreams. He is a resurrector of visions. He is a resurrector and restorer of marriages. Listen, Union, during the pandemic, you know how many friends had to close their churches? You know how many friends because, oh, they were locked down or whatever it was going on, they lost their faith? But Jesus didn't waste a moment with us. He sustained us. He strengthened us. And he's positioned us for a move that's spiritual, physical, supernatural, and can I tell you, very, very powerful. Jesus causes all things to work for the benefit of those who love him and are called according to their purposes for them. And Jesus is choosing us, choosing us to become a kingdom, kingdom family, calling us to a movement that we call the kingdom of God. Listen, don't waste the moments, the small ones or the big ones. Don't waste them. Good moments and bad moments, don't waste them. Moments of joy and moments of pain, don't waste them. You know why? It all works together. Every moment, every life, every decision. My question to you is, can we work together, all of us, in this movement, moment by moment, in 2022? Because I believe the future is bright. The day is dawning. 
And because it's all made of moments, this movement will be made of moments. A movement in which not only does he promise to stand with us, but also move with us in all that we do. My question to you is, would you be part of that movement? Would you stand with me? I'm going to offer you to make a choice today to give your life to Jesus. But before I do that, I feel some hearts that have been through some storms. And the ship you've been on has been weathered. I saw literally a vision of a ship that's been weathered. Your sails are tattered. Your rudder is loose. You're confused. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to decide. You're unsure because you don't know if that ship could withstand another shipwreck. I promise you one thing. God will have your back. You just have to decide, hey, I want in on this movement. Leave the reservation. Leave the trouble. Leave the doubt. And leave whatever you're upset about right here at this altar. You're free to come here, get prayer, kneel before God, leave it here. Let it die and let the Holy Spirit consume it. But leave here lighter. Leave here charged up with the Holy Ghost. Leave here full of faith. Leave here full of peace. Leave here full of hope. That he's with you. He stands with you. And as long as you got him, nothing can stop you. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you want to make that decision today, today's my moment. I'm not going to waste it. Today I give. In this moment, I raise my hand to give my life to Jesus. That he, I believe he lived, suffered, died, and resurrected for all the remissions of my sins, but also to bless every day that's left of, lung, of breath in my lungs with him, walking with him, standing with him, with this peace. If that's you, would you raise your hand so I could pray with you? Father God, we thank you. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you stand before us in this moment. Lord, we thank you that you're moving over us. We thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Revive us and refresh us. And stir our hearts for greater faith. Amen. Spirit was moving over the waters. Spirit come moving.